Well, for my colleagues out there who are watching this and when we upload the video, the reason I asked uh, Bill Dooley to stop by, uh, Bill is one of the real pioneers in the world, uh, uh, in my world of breast cancer, in the area of ductoscopy and has probably done more than any single individual uh, in ductoscopy. And every time I see Bill in meeting, I sort of want to know what's the latest and greatest on ductoscopy. Bill, why don't we, we've got colleagues who are sure that are watching mm -hmm. this that think, sticking a duck in somebody's nipple? What are you doing here, man? Why don't you just sort of, if you wouldn't mind, describe the process, give us a little bit of an overview of ductoscopy and where we're kind of at currently with ductoscopy. Um, I think one of the best ways to explain it is to explain actually how I got into ductoscopy in the first place. Um, we know that most breast cancers seem to take at least 10 to 20 years to get started from the initial genetic events until you get the clinical cancer that someone feels or sees on a mammogram. That's a long prodromal period right. and gives us a great opportunity to screen for something and treat it and prevent it from progressing to cancer in the first place. Right. Unfortunately, all of our imaging technology so far has been directed at finding the breast cancer. So mammography, ultrasound, MRI are geared toward finding the breast cancer, but are very, very poor at finding the pre-malignant diseases that give rise to the breast cancer, or identifying something different about a high-risk woman beyond mere breast density. Um, in the course of looking at the genetic events and the laboratory, uh, in laboratory models, it appeared that one of the earliest events were irregular divisions where the chromosomes were broken or the chromosomes separated unevenly from one side to another. And to look at that, we should be able to see that happening in the lining of the ducts because most breast cancers, 95% arise from the lining of the ducts, we should be able to see that. But we had no good way to access that cellular material. Very good. So that led me to first washing the ducts and eventually to actually taking a submillimeter endoscope about the size of a fine mechanical pencil lead and putting it down ducts that were making fluid to try to find the source of the fluid where in the duct was irritated or something growing that could be causing the fluid. Uh, some of those patients who have nipple fluid actually have premalignant cells and a few actually have malignant cells the nipple and one day uh, in January in 2000 at Hopkins I had six patients who had malignant cells in nipple fluid and took them all to the operating room and found them with uh, my first day of scoping. Bill, what a story. I mean that's really unusual and again for any lay people who are, are watching this, uh, you know, it, it, that's not a typical story. Of course, Hopkins, you were at one of the world's finest places at that point, tends to sort of filter in materials like or patients like that, you know, etc. So, Bill, where do you see that um, ductal lavage has kind of gone away? Uh, there's been some issues, of course, of, you know, the cost of producing these scopes. I loved it when I was doing it for a while because we could um, actually uh, end up uh, biopsying. I think you had developed a little biopsy tool to go along with the scope. Here we are now in 2012. What's going on today and what do you see in the future for ductoscopy? The limits of ductoscopy is since we're using a scope that's under a millimeter in diameter, right. we really can only get out brushings and clusters of cells, not real tissue biopsies. And we're still heavily dependent upon tissue biopsies in breast pathology. Um, the Germans have begun to develop a series of small scopes and various ways to get uh, biopsies. They're using some new technology where they use autofluorescence uh, to identify abnormal areas in the ductal system, much as is being done in bronchoscopy, okay. to figure out areas to biopsy you're still getting a chunky cytology, which requires you to use molecular markers instead of traditional pathology methods to identify 
high-risk lesions or cancers. As we're learning from all the gene array studies that are being done in breast cancer, right. we're quickly ar assembling a huge array of things right. that would tell us who has a cancer and who doesn't. Right. Right. So the, that technology, the molecular pathology technology, needs to catch up to our ability okay. to scope the breast. Okay. And we're probably a few years from that. The other thing that uh, is probably crucial in the whole role of ductoscopy is uh, we have vast majority of the world that does not have mammographic screening and will never really be able to afford Good. mammographic screening. Good. And for those areas of the world, oftentimes nipple discharge is a more common presentation for breast cancer. And there's no other way to screen high-risk women than to look at cytology from the nipple. If we can come up with a molecular cytology approach to screen women from little bits of nipple fluid, anybody who had an abnormality, then we could scope and find where the abnormality was and potentially treat it or prevent it from progressing to cancer. So the real hope for breast cancer throughout the third world and around the world that the, outside of the U.S. and North America and what, Europe is going to be some better way of screening for pre-malignant disease and arresting its progression long before it ever turns into cancer in the first place. Yep, very good. And, and your good friend and mine, Susan Love, I know, has been working on this. We wish Susan well. If she happens to be. She's been recovering from an illness here recently, and and I know she's excited about this whole area as well, as well yes. as yourself. And I think you shared with me yesterday that there's going to be a, maybe a newer attachment to make the scope a little bit easier to use, and you're working uh, with the, some people on that as well. Yes, so. we're, the scopes are going to be made where they uh, can attach to regular laparoscopy equipment, so that yeah. makes it uh, okay. much more practical. All right, Bill Dooley. Melissa, my friend, always good to see you. Thank you. As I said, uh, this is really special. See if we can get that posted. And, and congratulations on all the really wonderful work you're doing have been doing. You're one of our real pioneers. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.